real visitation of the Lord today in worship. <clears throat> How many could sense that, that God was doing something? And as we were standing in the altar there, I, I heard the Spirit of the Lord. I, I saw it in the Spirit. The, I could see the walls of Jericho crumbling. Yeah. Hallelujah. Just crumbling. And I believe that's what's taking place, that there have been some barriers that the enemy has resurrected to keep us out of our inheritance. And um, we just, you know, you just, you just have to stand in faith that God is going to do amazing things. Um, in prayer this week, the Lord dropped this in my spirit. He said, son, if it's dead, I'll resurrect it. If it doesn't exist, I'll create it. And if it's impossible, I'll do it anyway. <clears throat> we, uh, America is in the fight of her life right now. Not, not just America, but uh, Daniel talks about that when the devil realizes that his time is short, then he becomes great ang he becomes very angry. The Bible says he comes down in great wrath and he increases his attack. And uh, we have seen uh, this horrendous mistake that was made in Israel with the, the bombing. Uh, and it's the enemy's attempt to make the world hate God's people, to try to set it back. And, and I would encourage you in prayer that you would begin to intercede that this thing will not take decades to repair, but that God will supernaturally give favor back to that nation because the enemy has, is coming great, great wrath. Uh, we've watched uh, what's happened in our legal system. Uh, I'm not going to use a bunch of words because we're going to try not to get kicked off of social media. But uh, we're seeing uh, the injustice in this nation that's trying to circumvent what, what the enemy does not want to happen, what God is declaring is going to happen. And there, there is this attack on, on, the, on the people of God and on this nation because the enemy sees that something phenomenal is being released in the spirit realm by the power of the Lord. And so uh, God, the only reason that Regeneration Nashville exists is God created this church for this time. Not for any other season. Uh, many of us have labored for decades, and yet God has assembled. And we exist right now. We should not exist. We've went through so much adversity. It should have killed us, but we stand today in the power of the Lord. And <clears throat> this city, God has called us to this city. And I am believing that God is going to give us 50,000 people in this city for the kingdom of the Lord. You, you're going to have to step out. Of, we have a tendency to believe God for what we can do in our own ability. And once we step over that barrier, then that's where the enemy will begin to speak to you. And we've watched over the years some very large Pentecostal churches that were birthed in the fire for this city to be changed by the power of God, and yet every major Pentecostal large church in Nashville has pretty much died or else has fallen into great um, loss, and they're a mere shadow of themselves. And I believe that God has raised this church up to relight the fires of Pentecost in the greater Nashville area for the glory of the Lord. And so I am going to challenge you by the power of God to enlarge your territory. 
Don't be content with just enough that makes you comfortable. If you heard my podcast on Wednesday night, um, you heard me talk about this. We must be consumed with what God wants. Never be content for less than what God wants. You know, Lord, if that's what you want, I'm willing to do it. But if you don't, then that's fine because I'm happy where I'm at. I want God to consume me that I can't sleep unless we see what God wants done. And we can't be content unless we see what God wants. And so uh, I want to preach to you out of the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews. I want to talk about the rest of God. We're going to read several verses. God began to speak to me of this this week. In uh, verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, that he has said, I have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, that God did rest from all of his works. In verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Verse 8, for if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not. Afterwards, it's spoken on another day. There remaineth, therefore, a rest. There remaineth, therefore, a rest. There remaineth, therefore, a rest. Hallelujah. To who? To the people of God. And he that is entered into his rest, speaking of God's, He is also let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, Holy Spirit, preach today. Hallelujah. Oh, what's in thy heart, Holy Ghost? Take my mouth, my spirit, my tongue, and release it to these people around the world. Hallelujah. Oh, God, Lord, that the spirit, the head of the serpent, be crushed today by the anointing of the preached word of the Lord. For your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Cut the head of the serpent of unbelief off in thy people and oh God Lord let us enter into the rest of the Lord so Holy Spirit we rest in thee today and declare that all is well in Jesus name amen be seated I want to go all the way back to Genesis because Everything of God's purpose is capsulized in basically the first three chapters. God did not create Adam and then say to him, I want to fix the earth and I want to make some birds and some trees and some mountains and some oceans, but I can't do it on my own. I need your help. He didn't do it that way. He never created Adam on the first day because he did not 
need Adam's help to create what he was creating for Adam. And man's first full day of existence was the seventh day. He was created somewhere towards the end of the sixth day. But his first full day that he enjoyed the earth, he was living in the rest of God. And God took him on a tour, and he said, I made this for you. Enjoy it. So first of all, everything that God does is outside of the realm of our ability. God does not share his glory. This is why the Lord is preparing you and I to walk in another realm that we've never walked in, that we have to learn to walk in faith. It's a one thing to say, I have faith, but it's another thing, hallelujah, to walk it out by the power of God. But can I tell you that faith can do anything. Faith creates. And so I just wanted to take a journey through some of these verses starting with the first one, chapter 4 of Hebrews. He starts out here, he's, he's talking about rest. And the word rest here literally means rest. It means repose. It means ceasing from your own strength, from your own labor, from your own intellect. It literally means that you are in a, in a posture of where you are relaxed. So this is where the Bible is saying, it says, starts off, he says, therefore, let us therefore fear. And I hadn't really, this not impacted me like it has, but he said, let us therefore fear lest a promise being less of us entered into his rest that you don't make it that you come short a bit. He said, you need to fear. The word fear literally means, and one of its meanings means terror. He said, terror needs to get a hold of your soul. That through unbelief, you fail to enter into the rest of God. There is not one sickness in this building right now. There is not one disease in any believer that's under the sound of my voice that was not already dealt with at Calvary when the whip began to hit the back of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I was praying with somebody this week and I told him, I said, one of those stripes had your name on it. Oh, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, we are not going to fall short of the rest of God. Listen, faith calls the devil a liar. Unbelief calls God a liar. You have to decide whose report are you going to believe. And you will never walk in the realm of faith as long as your old soul man is dominating you. But I can tell you this. Faith can make gallons of oil come out of one little jar for a widow woman. Faith can turn a valley of ditches full of water when there should not have been any. Faith can take a sword of Goliath and cut it his own head off of it. Faith can take a 13 by 4 lake that's in a tempest storm and one word says peace, be still. Faith can take a blind man from birth, recreate his pupils, his corneas, hallelujah, and give him instant sight and then download into his brain what he's looking at that he knows what it is.
hours. May God open your eyes. I pray that you would have your eyes open like Elisha's servant and that he would see that there were more in heaven than there was for the enemy. I declare to you in the name of the Lord that faith is on our side and nothing shall be impossible with God. So may God put a holy reverence in our spirit that drives us to a realm that says, oh, that I will not fall short of the promises of God. I love the story of, of Enoch. And it says this in Hebrews 11, 5. Of course, it's talked about, I think, in Genesis chapter 5. But it said, we know this, the ver- there's a verse that says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then in Genesis, or in, in Hebrews, says this, says, Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. What was his testimony? It was faith. He literally believed everything that God talked with him because at the age, I think, of 300 and, like 365 that God had been talking with this man all these years, the Lord just translates him into heaven. So his testimony was a testimony of faith. Everything that God would tell any, he'd go, I believe that. So then you go to Hebrews and it says this, that you and I are made overcomers by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony. What is that testimony? It is the testimony of faith that we believe that God can do anything. So I'm going to skip down. We'll probably come back here, but... Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. In other words, he's saying, and up in his previous verse, he said that the Israelites, because of their unbelief, after everything that they saw, everything they saw, they still did not believe that God could give them Canaan land. God has a high tolerance for our weaknesses. But I'll tell you one thing that will tick God off is when he has done miracle after miracle in our life. And we still can't believe. And you say, well, I don't know about that. The Bible says this, that Israel made him swear in wrath that they brought God to a point of wrath. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I won't destroy you, but I am so angry with you because of your unbelief uh, that I swear in my wrath that you will never enter in to your inheritance. And it took them 40 years to die out before the Lord said, I'll take your children that you said would be prey to the giants and I'll let them take your place and they will walk in your inheritance. I, I ask forgiveness, God. Lord, let me never bring you to a place of wrath that you can make a promise to me and declare it time and time again. But when the rubber hits the road, it's, well, I don't know if God can do it. It looks really rough. Every possibility is dead and it's over. But God said, don't you know when you come to the end of your rope, you just got to let go because I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will come through for you. So what the Hebrew says here is that There are dimensions of the supernatural provision 
that were made available to other people, but because of their unbelief, they never stepped over into it. But what God is saying is, it didn't kill the provision. It's still there. He said, I'm just waiting for another group that'll have the faith to walk into my rest. And so, <clears throat> says that God rested on the seventh day from his works. Verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, he that has entered into the rest of God, what is rest? It is just simply a dimension where God does it all. In 2 Peter 1 and 5, it talks about, it says, giving all diligence to your faith. And the word diligent literally means <clears throat> being consumed or giving all of your energy, being focused <clears throat> on that. And then in Hebrews, the faith chapter eleven six, it says this, the Lord is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is what I've learned about God. That God will never move supernaturally as long as you have a backup plan. Because backup plans say we don't have faith that God's going to do it. So, well, I believe that God can and he might. But if he doesn't, we've got a second chance. And God's saying, but if I do it, that, let that happen, then I don't get the glory. Right. Hallelujah. doesn't matter how much hell has come against our new building. I promise you that we will stay in that building and it will be paid for and that God will come through. And boy, the enemy for a while has just tried to wear me out because of what we need. Well, listen, we borrowed all the money we can borrow. We can't borrow any more money. And we're still $3 million short, which really we're going to need in the next four to five weeks to finish this building. Years ago, my wife and I for about 15, 20 years, I've told you this, we would drive around this city and we believed God for a home that was impossible for us where we were financially. And a f few years ago, God gave us that home. And I was talking with my wife the other day because I told her, I said, you know, we're so thankful for our home. We got 40 acres of land, and it's private. Nobody can surprise us. And where we lived for 28 years, people would come up and knock on our door and take pictures, and uh, <clears throat> it was rough. And so I went to prayer, and I told the Lord, I said, I'm going to sell my house because that will bail us out. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, if you sell your house, you let the enemy rob you of what faith gave you because you're not believing that I will come through. And so $3 million is a lot of money. You say, Pastor, where's it coming from? From the Lord. From the Lord. But whether it comes to a whole bunch of people getting a vision and sending it in the next four weeks or it comes from one person, all I know is that God cannot lie. Yes. Hallelujah. God cannot lie. And we are holding God to his word. Hallelujah. We are holding God to his word.
And I refuse to allow the spirit of unbelief to keep us from our rest, that a year from now, we're still trying to figure out how to get in our building. But I am declaring that when we go into that building on the first service, we're going to look at each other and go, we should have got a bigger boat. So the Bible here, and I still haven't got to why I'm preaching this message. But the scripture says this, that when you enter to his rest, you also cease from your own works as God did his. And I was looking at that verse because the next one seems to contradict it. If verse... 9 says there remains a rest to us. And verse 10 says that when we've entered to his rest, we've also ceased from our own works as God did his. Verse 11 says, let us labor, therefore, to enter to that rest. And I, th- I thought, I got to look this word up because the actual the word labor there normally it literally means that it means work it means man's effort and here he's saying there remaineth therefore a rest and that when we enter let us labor to enter to his rest i'm thinking my god that just sounds tough here we're trying to get in the rest of God and we're just working ourselves to a, to a, a frenzy trying to find, you ever felt like, God, where is the realm of rest? And you're thinking, I, I can't find it and we're struggling in prayer and you're fasting, you're seeking the Lord. But this is, this is what the word labor means. The translators didn't do a good job here. Instead of saying, let us labor to enter to his rest, it literally means let's use speed, let's promptly, let's with haste enter into his rest. So what he's saying is you don't have to work to get into the rest of God. That when God begins to open up the dimension, hallelujah, of rest, he said, don't worry about it being on you. He said, you need to get with speed. Hallelujah. You need to hasten. You need to gather up your garments. You need to be like the children of Israel where the Lord said, you're going to celebrate the Passover, but do it with a staff in your hand and shoes on your feet because you are not going to be here very long. I curse the spirit of the devourer. I call money in in the name of the Lord. I call millions of dollars in not only for 709 Parkway, uh, Rivergate Parkway. Uh, I call in a location in Franklin. Uh, I call in locations all over this city. Uh, I declare in the name of the Lord uh, that we are taking back the city of Nashville. Uh, we curse the Parthenon. Uh, we curse that Athenian idol that stands there uh, that's got a chokehold on this city and said, This city belongs to me. Uh, I declare in the name of the Lord. Uh, we bind every demon spirit of idolatry and we loose the anointing of God to break that thing. So God said, you can get into my rest with speed. You know what unbelief does? makes God unemployed. Unbelief stops God dead in his tracks. And you know, I've I've talked to the Lord about this in prayer because wonderful men of God over the decades and even now in this nation that 
have raised up wonderful churches. And, you know, I hear stories. You know, we were in a building program, and somebody came in and gave us $10 million. And, you know, we, we were, I was listening to Pastor Robert Morris, who's one of the most anointed teachers. Tremendous man of God. And I'm listening to one of his messages, and he said, you know, our, me and my elders got together, and we had $60 million debt. And we wanted to just get that debt off of the church, and so we made a plan to get rid of the debt off of our church over a period of years. And he said, I just wanted to tell you today that in less than a year, we wiped out $60 million. And I'm thinking, I need some of that. <laughs> but see you cannot enter into God's rest without entering into the dimension of faith faith is only seen by the spirit and this is why the Bible says where there is no vision you could really <clears throat> change that verse. It says, where there is no faith, the people perish. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for faith. Nicholas would not be alive today if it wasn't for faith. Joshua would have died in sin in a gay lifestyle if it was not for faith. My wife would still be depressed today if it was not for faith. Hallelujah. I would still be preaching to a small congregation if it was not for faith. God, hallelujah, has raised up you and you and you and you and you because you are people of faith. And he's challenging you by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. That he wants to, he's saying to us, don't let my blessings to you become a substitute for your faith for me to move. It doesn't matter how great God is. It doesn't matter how many blessings he's done. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. I loose the supernatural in this building in the name of the Lord. I loose your children. I call your children in. Hear me by the word of the Lord. God said that the testimonies are getting ready to come up in this body of parents that are going to say, I want to declare that God brought my child back home. God brought my son back to the cross. God turned my life around in my children, hallelujah, and saved them. Pastor, I want you to meet my son. I want you to meet my daughter. God has set them free. I break the spirit of homosexuality off of this generation in the name of the Lord. I call back in our prophets, our psalmists, our worship leaders in Jesus' name. God made you and I to enter into the rest of the Lord. Really to, to understand, especially the New Testament, this is why it's important to have other books along with the Bible when you study because you need to understand the culture for when that was written. Jesus, when he would do many, many parables, he was using examples of how they lived in their culture that don't apply to now. For example, when you read the scripture that says, and you will heap coals of fire on their head. We think, you know, we're setting somebody's head on fire. That's not what he's talking about. He was saying this, that in that culture, they didn't have matches. And so if somebody's fire went out, if you wanted to help them, you take a basket and you had it lined where it wouldn't catch on fire and you took some of the coals from your fireplace 
and you put it in there and you carried it to them so they could relight their fire. It was an act of kindness. So the Lord makes his statement. He said, take my yoke upon you, <clears throat> for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But he was speaking to a culture that used oxen to plow their fields. And in that culture, when a, a baby ox was born <clears throat> that was destined at some time to pull the cart to plow the field, it didn't understand how to do it. So they would take that little ox and they would put the weight of the yoke on the mother. And they would just attach, tie the, the little oxen to the yoke. But he didn't have the weight on him that he had to pull it. So he's walking along thinking, this is pretty easy. I'm not under any labor. What he didn't realize was his mama was doing all of the pulling. And he was just walking along, but he didn't have to exert any strength. What Jesus was saying was, take my yoke upon you because I'll carry the load. If you just connect to me, he said, I won't make you work. I'll let you enter into my rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God is saying, I need some men and women today in this building that'll get up alongside of Jesus and get attached to where he's going that as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, that they would get underneath that, and God will say, it's all right, as long as you're by my side, I'll carry the load, I'll plow the field, I'll bring in the harvest, and everything will be all right. So the Lord... Is declaring that if you believe entering into that rest, he said, don't fall into the same situation that the Israelites did. <clears throat> when you read this, The Bible says that God ceased from his own work. God's work is called man's rest. God's work is called man's rest. This is why you have to do it God's way. This is why God says, don't take a brother to court, no matter how justified you feel. He said, let me fight your battles. Why? <clears throat> why would God say that? Because when you enter into some battles, you cannot help it, but the poison of it will get in your spirit. And you may win, but you will be irreparably damaged. And it will poison your spirit. But if you will, when you take your hands off of something, God will put his hands on it. <clears throat> this is why you have to trust the Lord. This is why this whole fourth chapter here is talking about there remaineth therefore a rest. And I, I'm sure I'm, I'm stretching some of you, but I'm at a point in my ministry that either God is going to come through or we just shut it down. God 
will not fail. <clears throat> Hallelujah. God <clears throat> will not fail. I tell you this story. This, this story is told by Dr. Cho. He said, I had borrowed money to, to build, and he said, we had an economic collapse <clears throat> in our nation, and m so many of the people in my church had become unemployed and had lost businesses. He said giving was pretty much non-existent. <clears throat> and he said, it, I had a $50,000 note that was due, and it came down to that day. <clears throat> and he said, my wife talked to me, and he's, she said, you know, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. So he said, I went to prayer, and I'm seeking God, and God spoke to me, and he said, I want you to go to a certain bank, and I want you to walk in, and I want you to tell the president, I want you to write me a check for $50,000. So he said, I got some of my elders together, and I said, we're going to go over to this bank, and we're going to ask this president to give us $50,000. And his elders said, you are crazy. And they said, we will not go with you. So he said, I got to the bank, and he said there was a really long line of people out, even outside the door that were waiting to get in to talk to the president. And he said, I walked up to the door and I told them that I have something very important to say to the president. He said, they assumed that I was a government official. I said, I didn't tell him that. And they talked to the guard at the door, and he said, this man has something very important to say to the president. He said, they walked me past all of the line, and they walked me up to the door of the president, and the clerk or whoever brought him in looked at the president and said, this man is an official and he represents the bank or something and he, and he has to talk to you. And uh, Dr. Cho sat down and the man said, well, what, what is it? He said, well, he said, I pastor a church here in town. He said, well, you're not so-and-so? He said, well, no. He said, well, what do you want? He said, I need you to write me a check for $50,000 to pay this loan, contractors. And he said, well, what do you have for collateral? He said, well, I don't have any collateral. He said, but I got 10,000 people in my church, and I can have every one of them transfer their accounts to this bank, so I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> so the bank president called in somebody and they went online and they researched him and found out he did pastor church of 10,000 people. Vice president came in and looked at the president and said, you will lose your job if you write this man a check on his word with no collateral for $50,000. And the bank president sat there and looked at him and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> he said, but I'm going to write you a check because I'm trusting you for $50,000 out of my own personal account. He wrote him a check for $50,000. Dr. Cho went and paid the bill that he owed with just a few minutes to spare because of the spirit of faith. If all we are is a church that has good worship and challenging speaking and a good youth program, we are only duplicating 
what already exists. And what already exists is not having the effect on hell that it should. Our children should not be lost. Our pastors should not be hooked on pornography. There should not be depression as rampant in the church as there is in the world. Divorce should not be as high in the church as it is in the world. Our children should not be addicted and ADD and everything else messed up emotionally. What is that? The Bible said that the church is the salt of the earth. So God said, I'm going to reach into Nashville and I'm going to raise me up a people that have crazy faith, that will step out of the boat and declare if God don't do it, we're going to drown. But we're not getting a life jacket just in case. But we are declaring that if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. So if there remains, therefore, a rest... It's just that most of the church still lives in the wilderness. You know, the Bible says that the day that Israel walked into Canaan, it said this, and the manna ceased. And they ate of the fruit of the land. I'm tired of eating manna. I'm tired of having service after service that just duplicates itself and become predictable. And kid goes to bed at night, say, Mama, what's for breakfast in the morning? She says, manna. She said, but we had that last week. We had that last year. When's it going to change? She would have to tell him, baby, for me, it's never going to change. But there'll be a day, hallelujah, see those mountains over there? You're going to go. And I saw it. They're grapes so big that it takes two men to carry one cluster out of the inheritance of God's people. Grapes are symbolic of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is so much Holy Ghost that God has, wants to release in this building and across the airwaves, in the internet, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. As a man of God today, I come against unbelief. I curse it in the name of the Lord. He is the God of the impossible. He is the God of the impossible. He is the God of the impossible. I speak over every need in this building in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Rusty, come here, let me pray for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come right up here. Rusty got a diagnosis that we don't accept in the name of Jesus. And we are declaring today that when I lay hands on him, when he goes back to the doctor, they will say, we can't find it in your body. I hugged him today. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm healed. I'm healed. By his stripes, I am healed. So in the name of the Lord, hallelujah. Someday, in the name of Jesus, you trespassing demon spirit of cancer, of Parkinson's, I curse you in the name of the Lord. You're going to come out of this man of God. I call him a giant in the kingdom of the Lord. And now I release by faith the rest the rest of God, the rest of God, that all oh God, that all that you have sustained him for, that he will finish, hallelujah, in a heal and whole body. In the name of the Lord Jesus, kaya bababo sunday, hallelujah, cancer, ah, the power of the blood is against you. The word of the testimony of God is against you. Live, hallelujah, live out of your belly shall begin to flow rivers of living water in the name of Jesus. This tremor in the 
the name of the Lord, I cast it out of your body. Oh, I see you, you foul spirit. I command you the name of the Lord. Come out of his body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, son, I put a shout in your spirit. I put a shout in your belly. I put healing in your body. I declare that you are healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I challenge you, uh, if I could get a hundred people today in this building that would tell God, Lord, I'm going to enter into the rest of the Lord. We bind unbelief. We bind it off of your business. We bind it off of your body. In the name of Jesus, he on my Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ki on Sunday. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Abundance. The Lord says, I'm taking this house to a place of not enough, to abundance. And oh, says the Lord, I have found faith in this house, and you are pleasing unto me. And this day, saith God, you have stepped over into the walls of Jericho and the spoil, the spoil, the spoil, says the Lord, is a declaration to you that the land belongs to you. And all oh, this year, I declare, says God, will be a year of rest. It is a year that you will see the hand of God uncovered and revealed in the name of the Lord, that every did many, every spirit, Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, I curse Alzheimer's. To every believer that hears me around the world right now, I loose the spirit of healing. I see some of you lying in beds, paralyzed. I loose the Word of God into your bedroom right now, into your living room. In the name of the Lord, we loose healing power to New Zealand. We loose healing power, hallelujah, to Russia. We loose healing power to India, to Australia, hallelujah, to Belize. In the name of the Lord, to Mexico. In the name of Jesus, faith, 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 hallelujah. The abundance of God, the rest of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, bring the spirit of rest. Lord, let the spirit of rest come upon us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That, Lord, we cease from our own labors. God, we cease from our own labors. Hallelujah. Oh, Holy Spirit, I'm being obedient to you. We are ceasing from our own labor. We are declaring, hallelujah, the abundance of God. The devour that has come against businesses in the name of Jesus. I reverse that right now in the name of the Lord. And I command the enemy to not only stop, but give back with interest seven times what he has stolen in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Shataya Bobobo Sunday. In the name of the Lord, we command depression to walk out of this building right now in Jesus' name. I loose miracles in living rooms right now of men and women that are watching. Some of you are standing with your hands raised. And oh, I loose the healing power of God in the name of Jesus. I loose, hallelujah, the virtue and the rest of the Lord in this building right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we rest in you. God says he doesn't want us to build it. He wants us to enjoy it. Lord, may the spirit of rest today be in this place. 
God, with speed, today we enter with speed and with haste. As my prayer partners come, I want to tell you something about faith. People feel like, you know, you got to have a visitation from God or you got to have a feeling. I'm going to tell you what faith is. It's a choice. You choose. You have to choose to believe. <clears throat> you have to choose to believe. Well, I'm talking to you. If you want to, you need a prayer partner, come quickly. Join hands with one of them. They'll pray with you on anything that you need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We rest in the Lord today. God, may we just take a deep breath in this building and just rest in God. That song, is that you said, I believe? Let's sing that for a little minute. I want to give you something to think about. The tabernacle was the outer court, the holy place, and then the holiest of holies, where the high priest would come in and fellowship with God once a year. And the Lord told Moses, he said, Aaron, when he comes into my presence, before he comes to the holiest of holies, he has to take off his garments that he normally wears and he has to put on linen. Because when they wore wool, it made them sweat. And sweat reminded God that it was unbelief that took man out of the Garden of Eden. And God told Adam, he said, you're going to live now, but not in rest, but by the sweat of your brow. So the Lord said, when that high priest comes into my presence, he has to have on linen because that fabric breathed said this about you and I we have been made kings and priests under God our failure is we come into the presence of God so many times without taking off man's attire man's mentality and we just sweat in the presence of the Lord and God saying, I can't do anything. He said, I need you to go back out. And I need you to dress yourself in linen. 